All right. Hi, everyone. I am Kristen Anderson. I am the Director of Engagement and Annual Giving in the Office of Advancement here at St. Francis College. Uh, we wanted to thank you so much for joining us today for our seventh Terrier Talk, From SFC to the Sweet Life, Finding the Right Career Chemistry, with our very special guest, Robert Husenak, SFC Class of 77. So we're so excited for Bob to join us today. It's always really fun to have our alumni return to the college, share their stories and their success. Um, and it's even better when we can talk about candy. So lastly, I just wanna thank Bob for joining us. I wanna thank the Office of the President, our moderator, Dale Favors, um, and the Special Events Department for their partnership on this event. We hope you all enjoy it. We hope you leave inspired. And now I'll turn it over to President Miguel Martinez Sainz. Thanks, everyone. All right, thanks, Kristen. I'll be brief because I want to, I want to hear the gems. And I, you know, Bob, I want to say we, we had a good, nice chat the other day. But I always tell young people things are often not what they seem, right? And I have this like kind of thing: things fall apart when pulled apart by what seems. But I think was 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 remarkable as I engage alums from the college. And I love your story the other day, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about it today. Is that we got to get our young people to imagine possibilities that they really can't imagine, right? It's trying to create conditions for how do you imagine the unimaginable? You can't. So one of the things that I love about Terry Talks and some of the things we've been doing with Career Spotlight is that folks like you come into a space to share, in fact, the unimaginable. Right. So when you were graduating St. Francis College, I would imagine the last thing you thought you were going to be the, the chief scientist for sweets at Hershey's. Maybe you, maybe you did. And I'm, I'm curious to see if that's if that's the case. But I think that that's an important part that that you you created conditions and we're trying to get our students to understand for when an opportunity arose, you walked through the door. Right. You were able to say, I have some skills and I think I can contribute. I didn't expect this to be the way I was going to contribute to the world but let me see what I can learn and if I can contribute in this way. And, and you've had an illustrious career. So I just wanna say very fundamentally, thank you for your presence. I think that uh, what I've learned from these talks um, that the speakers sometimes don't realize the impact they make and they're making an incredible impact on our students. Cause I hear the stories come back around about, did you hear when she said this or when he said that, I thought about this. And so I just want you to know, I have little doubt that you're sharing today is going to have remarkable impact. So thank you very much for your presence. I look forward to listening to you and Dale in conversation. Can you hear us now, Jamal? Yes, I think I can hear you guys now. Excellent. Perfect. I had to switch it up. Sorry for that technical difficulty. Uh, SFC family, first and foremost, good morning. It's a great day. Uh, we are blessed to be joined by SFC alumni, Bob, who's in a class of 77. I just want to personally thank you for coming, may it be virtually. We're extremely grateful you've taken the time to share your journey with us. I'm confident all will be inspired by the end of this talk. But before we move on, I thought that we should go through some very interesting things about Rob. So Rob was born in Brooklyn on November 16th. So your birthday's coming up. I want to wish you a happy birthday. Two weeks. And uh, you got the nickname Hurricane Bob. Now, Dale, make sure you get why he got that nickname. We need the full story on how he got nicknamed Hurricane Bob. Uh, Brooklyn born, he attended Bishop Ford High School and then St. Francis College, where he earned his bachelor's in chemistry and a minor in business. From there, he went to study at Pace University, where he earned an MBA in marketing and management in 1981. Today, Bob is Hershey's principal scientist and is credited with developing new technology for coating sugar-free items. Among his many significant career achievements will also include the three-year design, installation, and startup of the world's first continuous gum base and gum manufacturing line. Bob was a 2013 AACT Stroud Jordan Award recipient, and in 2014, he was inducted into the Candy Hall of Fame. So I'm asking you all to listen intently and when given the opportunity at the end, do not be afraid to ask any questions. We want to know the story, how Bob went from Brooklyn to Hershey. So without further ado, Dale, I'll pass it back to you. Everyone, I hope you enjoy this Terrier talk. Well, we appreciate you. Thank you, sir. 
It's nothing wrong with a little technical difficulty. It's all about how you overcome those particular challenges and move forward. And I think that ties in great to what we're going to talk about today with Bob. I'm Dale Favors. I'm a special advisor to the president's office here at St. Francis College. And I've enjoyed the journey with the school on these terror talks. And to have a special guest today to speak to us who is an alum is just a pure pleasure. So Bob, thank you and welcome back to campus, even though it is virtual. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank uh, St. Francis College for having me and the nice introductions that uh, you all have given me. Well, let me ask you this, Bob, just to get us started. Jamal brought this point up, Brooklyn born, St. Francis College, still in Brooklyn. And then now you're in Hershey, Pennsylvania. How did that happen? Well, being a New Yorker and uh, uh, wanting to stay local, you know, when you're going to high school, uh, uh, it was two high schools and I, Bishop Ford was where I wound up going. Um, St. Francis College was another uh, local school with a good education, uh, good curriculum. I uh, wanted to go into chemistry and I heard they had a very good chemistry uh, 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 platform along with wonderful uh, professors. And then ultimately by accident in career, career I wound up uh, here in Hershey. Uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, when I graduated, uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, friends who was graduated the same year with me, Joy Lim, um, told me there was a position out in uh, American Cyanamid in New Jersey. So I went there uh, and uh, for quality control uh, technician and spent uh, four or five months there. And I didn't like commuting since I'm a New Yorker, you know, train buses and you're there. Um, and then another uh, person who I went to St. Francis with, John Casey, had a friend in the New York City Department of Health uh, that said uh, they had a position for a uh, chemist to do uh, a sampling of newborn in infant's blood to, for sickle cell anemia, galactosemia, and I think hyper hypertension. So I went there and Spent about, about six there, eight months there. And then I, I was on a New York City at st state grant. And I was told at the time, uh, New York City and the state were going bankrupt. So my boss kind of like told me, uh, my suggestion would be to start looking for another job. Hmm. <laughs> That's so deep. I said, thank you. And I sent out, you know, my, at that time, you had to type each cover letter and Type each resume, so or or get them printed. So yeah, make sure you didn't make any mistakes. That's right. <laughs> so sent them out, and uh, at that time Warner Lambert, American Chickle, or I should say Warner Lambert, said, "Come on down for an interview." I said, "Great." So uh, that was in Long Island City. Uh, nice commuting distance, twelve miles from work, and it didn't. It was an hour and a half either either way by car or train. Um, and went there for the interview, walked into the lobby and the guard goes, who are you here to see? I said, I'm here for an interview. The beauty behind that was nobody knew I was coming. I, I'm like sitting there in the lobby going, the guy goes, no, you're not scheduled for anything today. We don't have any. So I say, can you please check? So they, I guess somebody made some phone calls out to the corporate headquarters in Jersey, found out that. I did have an interview, but he in pulled the interview very quickly. And, you know, two or three hours later, when went home a week later, I got this uh, letter saying, congratulations, come on down. We'll, we start this date, went back and I'm thinking I'm going to be Park Davis drug development and everything. And little did I know when I went in there that day, I was, my boss goes to me, okay, this person here is going to teach you how to make chiclets, trident, and bubblicious. And I said, huh? And 42 years later, it's now, 
icebreaker gum, icebreaker mints, and a few other Jolly Rancher and uh, Twizzlers. Amazing. It's amazing how careers go. And the, the key piece that I hope everyone takes from this, and, and guys, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll make sure to get to them throughout. But the, the, the big piece I heard, two things. One was relationships. And two was being able to, to make adjustments or pivots. Right. And, and it sounds as if, and here's what I think everyone at the, especially at the college level, even some adults to this day, you have situations where you work for a company or about to go work for a company. And most people don't have, in some cases, don't have a full gist of all the things that that company does. Like you didn't know that Warner Lambert okay. had, you know, part of, they were a pharmaceutical company. You thought that they made just made pharmaceutical. You didn't know that they had a consumer side of the business in right. which they focused on making chewing gum. That's right. That, that is an adjustment you then had to, you had to, it was an aha moment, but it was also an adjustment because you went in thinking one thing and did the other. How, hmm. how have you made adjustments and what other adjustments have you had to make throughout your career? Well, when I started there, uh, and one always likes to progress up the and, and enhance your career. So I spent uh, five years there uh, acting as a sponge, uh, trying to learn everything I could. Um, I was uh, uh, got a promotion to an in international position with them. So I started seeing the world on one Lambert. Uh, going to some of the factories globally for new products. And then I decided that uh, I needed to grow in my career. So it was funny, one of my uh, sales reps, uh, Marty Mangus, uh, had uh, just come back from Chicago and said, you know, there's a position in Leaf Incorporated in Chicago. Uh, I put your name in, uh, the guy said, send, send him a resume. I said, okay, I just, just had uh, our first child and went, sent a resume and uh, Ben Houston said, come on down for an interview. Went for the interview and he goes, you're just what we're looking for. When can you start? So I said, let me go home and talk first and then I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back home, spoke to my wife and she goes, whenever you want to go. So just by chance, it was on my birthday I started back in 1986. Wow. So, and uh, Leaf was a small company versus a large company like uh, American Chickle. Mm -hmm. One of the things, again, that, that you learn quickly is when you go to your boss and say, okay, I need some engineering process work or I need to talk to QC. And my boss goes, well, just put your hat on in a different direction. <laughs> you, you begin to learn all these things that you need to learn to progress in, in your career. And uh, that's the company that uh, I put together the continuous uh, units uh, in, in our plant down in Memphis. Uh, I did a lot of traveling to Europe uh, because a lot of the I should say most of the confectionery equipment is produced in Europe at the time. Now it's produced uh, uh, everywhere in the world. At that time it was mostly in Germany and France. That's where we went over a three year period and uh, installed it there. And it could produce enough gum in one year to cover the earth two inches thick. Wow, wow, that's amazing. So you talked about Again, I heard a couple of things and I'm going to circle back to relationships. It sounded as if relationships are some of the things that led to other opportunities for you. Correct. You talked about different people who are classmates who told you about different opportunities. Are, 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 to you, are relationships important? Well, you, you need relationships to succeed. You need relationships to keep your sanity. You need relationships to uh, just 
communicate good, bad, or indifferent things because, you know, you, you've got your relationships at work where you, you build up uh, them and then and you do that through respect for each other and trust. Got it. If I don't trust you. You have no respect. You, you know, your relationships are going to be few and far between. Um, yeah. You know, you, you have to have a sense of ethics too because people need ethics and trust uh, go hand in hand. Um, that's, that's, that's so true. I mean, I, I think about that because we all have to have empathy and respect for each other. We have to have uh, ethics that we operate by and we have to trust that we will do the right thing by each other and it's so important especially in the world today there's such uh, so much more need of that that one word right there trust right. and and a person that's in leadership that's in a leadership position like you how do you go about building teams that that emulate those thing three things that you talked about uh, a sense of ethics respect for each other and trust transparency you if you are transparent with your team uh, they, they begin to understand and they, uh, some people, you know, come up to you and say, you know, I, I, I have an issue I want to talk to you about. And I say, talk freely. It doesn't leave this room. It doesn't leave my head. I always tell people if I ever bang my head, a lot of people will be in trouble. Uh, <laughs> if I, I, if I try to maintain a good, good communication and a, uh, where people can come and talk to me. Uh, when we're in uh, meetings, you know, you have to be open. You got to, I'm very blunt at meetings. If I, if, if, if the answer is A, and you know, I always listen to opinions, which you have to, but opinions sometimes and options are taking you down a path that you shouldn't be going down. So you have to bring people back into the, the uh, reality. And I also be believe in levity. Because sometimes levity is very important to bring a meeting back into some, you know, all meetings are stressful to a point and some levity to just ease up the stress is important to me. Yeah, so, so that transparency is important. The transparency builds the trust. And if everyone understands that you as the leader are operating with a certain sense of ethics and a certain respect for each other because you're willing to listen to those opinions of others, then there's this, this sense of trust and transparency and all that, that, that comes about that allows for those teams to operate at a high level. Uh, and it's important. Now, tell me this, did you, did you start building those leadership skills at, while you're in college at St. Francis? Uh, yes, you, you, you listen, uh, the, the most important part as you said, is listening. You have to listen. You don't listen. You, 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 you're creating your own little world and you're not going to be able to respond to the questions or uh, the situations. Uh, in St. Francis, it, it, I'll, I'll give you a funny story. My, uh, I forgot who the professor was, philosophy. Uh, it was, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, first class, the professor said, I believe in brevity, shortness, to the point. Okay, that stuck in my head. I was listening. And when the final came, the question was, because. Hmm. And I wrote my answer, and 30 seconds later, I was at O'Keefe's. <laughs> And the answer I gave was, why? That was it. <laughs> Somebody said, why didn't you put why not? I said, that's two words. It wasn't one. It, it, it's important to listen. Uh, yeah. And uh, it, it starts at a young age where you have to listen. Uh, if you want to survive in your family. <laughs> That's but, right. Uh, it, it starts at young age. It goes, it follows you through. If you're, if you've learned it, you, you follow it and you use it. 
Well, no, that, that's a key piece. And you talked about your philosophy class and, and obviously President Miguel being a, a, a guy who is a philosophy major. Uh, I believe his PhD is in philosophy. He loves that. But uh, some other questions we have is around, you, you talked about coming to St. Francis, you knew that you wanted to study chemistry. Right. And you were able to pursue that there. Were there any other um, classes or, or, or did you have a minor or anything that you said, okay, well, I want to major in chemistry and minor in business. So how did you go about making these decisions uh, as, well, as a student? Uh, chemistry, well, I'll take it one step back. It okay. chemistry didn't just happen because of St. Francis. If you go back to grammar school at St. Bernadette, I had a fantastic science teacher, Mrs. Turgro, right. and she instilled in me sciences. And I said, These, this is great. Then I went to Bishop Ford and I had John Bianchi as a, a teacher there who was, was great. And at one point I talked with him and decided that I liked chemistry, hated math, loved chemistry. And he goes, you gotta balance those two somehow. Uh, and I started at uh, St. Francis and focused in on chemistry. But one of the uh, areas I did take um, some accounting courses. I took one of the courses I took was uh, direct marketing with Mr. Petrocelli. <laughs> and I remember he was excellent teacher going down. He took the class down to the direct marketing convention at the Hilton in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, he, I, I learned that business, you needed some sort of business background if you wanted to succeed in anything you did. So that's why I went after there to get my M M MBA. Because I'd be sitting in meetings with marketing people and finance people and they'd be right. talking mumbo jumbo. And I had no idea what they were talking about with their acronyms and, so on. So I figured if I wanted to learn more, I'd have to go and get a business degree. So getting that MBA on top of the chemistry gave you the technical science knowledge, but also you began to understand that growth in your, for your career was important to have some fundamental understanding of business operationally. Is that, Correct. Is that why you chose to put together? Okay, good. I think that answers a lot of students' questions about how do you make these decisions that you need to make in order to direct your career? Because it's so important, especially you have many students who show up, they don't know, as you knew, you someone poured into you early and, and gave you this love for science. So you knew you wanted to pursue it in that way. Some people show up and don't have that, but it's good to, it's something I focus on, which is a term, um, it's called Aikigai, which is a Japanese term, finding your passion and, and your, where your passion becomes your work and, 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 and your mission. And that's kind of what you've done. So you've been on this mission, utilizing science as, as the backbone with an understanding of how to lead. And it's kind of, it's led you in a direction where you've created or have been part of organizations that have created items that we all know and love. Like you talked about the iceberg gum, you were involved in, in the creation of that or, or how did that, come about? That, uh, that was, we, Hershey had, uh, Hershey had bought Leaf Incorporated. That's when I had gone into Hershey. And then um, Hershey acquired the Nabisco brands of yep. uh, icebreakers. And we developed uh, ice, ice cube gum uh, based on them wanting to, to expand that. And we said, what do our, what do we have? What can we do? From a processing point of view, what's different? How can we? How can you make yourself different from those people or your competitors? So we came up with ice cubes. Nobody was making a cube, small cube gum, and so we set ourselves as a um, unique product, and we had our, built our niche in the uh, uh, marketplace. And and it's it's thinking outside the box is important. Yeah. And that's how you get these new ideas and patents and so on. And well, no, I don't. I don't think it, not only was it a new idea, but it took 
it, it, in business, we have this thing called the S curve where you have a period where a, biz, a, a product is on the rise. It starts slow. It, it begins on this rise. And then it gets to a point where the consumer is fulfilled with all that that product has to offer. So you, to recre, regenerate that S curve, you kind of recreate something to start it going back in an upward direction. And so that's what ice breakers did, I think, for the gum segment of the candy industry. Because if you think about it, we were you could buy a pack of gum for 25 cents, right? Trident. You could buy whatever, but then you had these more custom gum products that now you now you're paying a dollar and fifty cents, a dollar eighty cents for some gum, right? Yeah. And and that is recreating that. So that is important to for people to understand that this is how business is done. This is how you can rejuvenate whether it's your career, your 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 college life. You may start off as a student who. Hey, maybe first couple of years, you're not as focused, but then you find something that becomes your passion and you pursue it with vigor and you, you let those first two years go and you build on what you have. And, and that's what you have to be able to sell to employers, your, your ability to do this. And, and there was a question in here where someone asked, when you showed up for that interview and they didn't have you scheduled, you had an option. You could have said, forget it. I'm walking out the door but you were persistent and you said, no, I know I have an interview, find out how, who, who it is and let's figure out how we get this done. Right. What gave you that, that, that passion to not, to not just say no and give up? First of all, I, I was there <laughs> and, and I spoke to the gentleman in New Jersey who uh, I can't recall his name, uh, and he said, no, here, he gave me the address and I, and I said to him, you know, I wouldn't have come here today had I, had I not been told to come here today for this interview. I said, can you please somebody just check whatever, whoever that person was in New Jersey. And I guess somebody finally said he is here. Let's just check to see whether today is the right date or what. And they, I got to tell you, they pulled together a very, I said I was there three or four hours at, and they pulled together interviews. I've talked with five, six people that day. Wow. And so it was, they pulled together, uh, they did their work quickly so I could have uh, some, which happened to be a very good result. Yes. So they, they, they created, they, on the fly, they created an opportunity for, for you right. to present yourself but the whole piece was not only were you persistent but you were prepared correct how important is it to show up prepared oh my god you have to be prepared i mean well let me put it you this way anything in life you better be prepared for amen you don't you sometimes you get the unexpected but and those things are hard to prepare for but you go to, into meetings. You need to be prepared for questions that come out. You go uh, to um, take your kids somewhere. You know, be prepared for uh, what their questions are going to be. How do how do you help them? Um, you know, how do, how preparation to me is very important. I, I some meetings I'll I'll prepare the night before to make sure that you know. I try and think of what questions people will ask because I, I'd like to play a uh, devil's advocate uh, with, with myself on some of the questions uh, that could come up. But the, the preparation is utmost important. Right. So the preparation is key. And, and, and so there's a, there's a lot of gems that I hope people walk away with. One is preparation. One is being persistent finding what you love, and then also leading in a way in which you present, you, you have a certain level of ethics, respect for others, and, tr and you build trust by having transparency. I wanna ask you this, because I, I think it, it's so important for people to understand this right here. You work at Hershey. Correct. And most people may not know this, but we're gonna, we're gonna really talk about Milton Hershey. Milton Hershey, who is the founder and creator of the Hershey Company, uh, was an orphan and also 
gave back his his entire fortune because he didn't have kids or anything gave his entire fortune for the significance of for the purpose of leading others and right. giving back to others so he gave his entire fortune to the Hershey school that he's created and this town of Hershey Pennsylvania that exists because of what he has created what has that meant for you from a philanthropic standpoint to be part of such an organization and why is it important you believe to, to give back? Well, to me, Milton Hershey is probably one of the least known philanthropists out in the world. Okay. And it's really an honor to work for a company that believes in giving back to the community, the employees, the, uh, the school, and, and also in the area of uh, sustainability, uh, environmental, uh, environmentally, they're, they're there. Uh, human rights globally in regards to what they do in, uh, with, in the cocoa area, so on. It, it, it has brought me to understand what people need to do. You have to give back. Hmm. Give back, bring it forward, whatever term you want to use, but, but you have to, to uh, not only to make yourself feel a little bit better, but also to help those in need that really require it. Um, in, in the associations that I'm in, uh, we, we give back to the industry via mentoring upcoming students um, by uh, our having uh, presentations to students and, uh, and all this is for free. It's volunteering, and giving back to the communities in regards to uh, what, what uh, to enhance not only the companies that you work for, but the in, in, in industry as a whole, and to bring the next generation of people forward. Um, I believe in, uh, we used to, uh, my son used to go to a, a school um, with, uh, kids with learn, learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started, him and I started a golf outing for them. And uh, it, our first year, I think we made $600, didn't matter. We ran it for 10 years. And when we finally, the last year when they had it, uh, I think it brought in $30,000. So giving back that way to, to a good cause, is, is phenomenal. Well, no, and that's so important because here it is. You, you have been poured into in a lot of different ways and you're, you understand that. And so you decide that it's important for you to give back, whether that's giving back to those organizations where you, you give back by creating a way for others to give back through the golf outing or your college or whatever it is, I'm sure at Hershey, you guys have um, some, and, and from a corporate standpoint, they allow employees to go do some type of philanthropic work. Do Correct. you guys have entity? I'm sure there's something in the in the um, corporate culture that that promotes that. Is that right? That is correct. You you can go out uh, uh, time off and help us like uh, do f uh, food bank work. You can go and do uh, setting up golf outings. You can go out and work uh, at the uh, hospitals as needed, uh, like uh, what when you the guys have a Hershey Hospital too. Yes, we got the uh, Med Center right down the street. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, there's so many ways that we as individuals can give back, and and, and promoting the purpose of giving is, is part of, I believe, the the whole Franciscan way. So, as a student, we're there individuals at the school that really poured into you and promoted and, and inspired you to do more? I would say if you look back at uh, our, my, my professors that I had, Dr. Burke, Dr. Schneider, Dr. Quigley, Dr. Metz, uh, at that time, Professor Corrigan, um, they, they made you work and, and had you pursue what you wanted to do. 
it, it, and they made sure that, that the outcome was not for them, but for you. Uh, and, and like Dr. Metz, uh, people ask me what my uh, best chemistry course was. And I tell people physical chemistry and they look at me like I have nine heads. They said, that's one of the hardest classes. I said, yeah, but I had an out outstanding teacher uh, Dr. Metz, he worked out at Brookhaven National Laboratories, and his class was also on Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 4 o'clock. And it wasn't until recently I found out that Dr. Metz did all that for no salary. He enjoyed mm. giving back uh, for what he had, I guess, accomplished in, in his life. And I, and as I tell people, well, not only did he not take a salary, he probably lost money on it because he every day, every Saturday, he'd bring in donuts and coffees and take us out to lunches for finals and midterms. So he, he lost on the deal there, but he promoted uh, a positive uh, viewpoint to the, to the class. Well, that's, that's what it's about. And, and I tell you that I'm, I, I tell you now, you're, you're inspiring to many of those who are on the call. Uh, there's so many questions here. There's, uh, I think one of the, one of that questionnaire was something that, uh, is it Rodania had, had asked and, and uh, there's other people. And I, I think from the, the team in philanthropy who, who really wants to understand and want everyone to understand the importance of giving back this school has been here 160 plus years because of the generous giving from alumni and other organizations that understand the importance of that. So to work with an organization that is as inspiring when it comes to giving back is, is so important. I wanna ask you this, has there been times in, in whether it was as a student or in your career where you, you begin to second guess were you on the right track? Always, always, and, and it's good to do that because it makes you look at where you are, what you want to be, and where do you want to go. As many times I had been in my career, I said, you know, maybe I'll look for another job. Maybe I'll do this. And then you go for the interviews and you talk to them and you, you say, I'm not going to be any better. I, 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 I've and I hate to use this word, but you feel comfortable where you are and it's where you want to be. You need to be the one to make the choice. What you do, as I uh, told, I used to go to uh, Bishop Ford for career day and I used to tell the kids, uh, you know, don't listen to what your uncle Joe or uh, Aunt Tina tell you to be. You know, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be this. I said, no, you are yourself. You need to decide what you want to be uh, and, and pursue that. I yeah. said, if you don't pursue that, be, you will be miserable for your life because you followed somebody else's dreams, not your own. And not only that, will you be miserable, but everybody around you will be miserable. So it's important to take your dreams and go forward with them. You may fail. A time or two. Milton Hershey failed three times before he he succeeded. So, but you will succeed if you put your mind to it. Look, it's all about back to what this is all about that chemistry. Sometimes you have the right chemistry at the place you're working at, but you want to test and see if the waters are different somewhere else. You may find that where you are is the right place. You may also find that as you talked about Milton Hershey, it took him a few times to find this point of success, but he didn't give up, which is back to what we talked about. You, you, ha you have to be persistent. And sometimes what you, in every loss, there's an opportunity to learn. Correct. You, mistakes are learning opportunities. As long as you don't repeat the same one over and over again. Yeah. You will learn from your mistakes and don't be afraid to admit you made a mistake because again, people will respect you. It, it's not that you're weak if you say, I, I made a mistake. 
people will say, okay, well, what if you did this? What if they, they could guide you to, a, uh, to help you get out of that hole you're in? Yeah, that's a good point. And again, chemists get to this, this point of success through failure because not all compounds that are mixed together meet the expectations of what you're looking for. But so you have to go through that period of failure to get there. Right. But it's, it, what is the process from a standpoint of, since we were focused on gum, and I think people should also know you were involved in the creation of the Jolly Rancher is that, as well. Is that correct? No, Jolly Rancher was um, in leaf. Uh, I was there. That's been a, around many, many, many years. Okay. Candy that was made out in Denver. Uh, and uh, when uh, Hershey bought Leaf, it became part of the uh, Her part of Her Hershey, Hershey portfolio. But but Jolly Rancher is is a hard candy. I mean, each confection, whether you how you look at it or forget confection, any thing out on the market takes time to develop, time to grow, and time to. Uh, move on to success. It doesn't happen overnight. No, I, I think that's true. And something else I want people to be aware of, of you, Bob, and, and I think we're gonna allow this in. If you guys don't mind, um, and David Lufty, can you bring Glenn Husenick forward? I want him to ask his question directly, but I wanna ask you this. I wanna say this out loud so everyone knows. St. Francis for you is a family affair. Because yes. not just you were part of the, are part of the St. Francis alumni, but there's others. Is that right? You want to talk a little bit about that? Right. I've got uh, my brother uh, went to St. Francis. Uh, my sister-in-law went to St. Francis. Um, my brother-in-law went to St. Francis. So we've got we've got a lot of connections in uh, the St. Francis. It, it brought us together. Uh, my wife and I, uh, she went there for a short period of time. I got to know her, but I got to know her better after she left, unfortunately. Uh, but we, we've got to know people um, from, from there. Like, as I said, her sister went to St. Francis and I got to know her more after uh, she left. Got it. Uh, there's, there's, there's that are out there that I went to St. Francis and uh, still keep in contact with, and it, 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 it does linger with you. <laughs> hey, well, you know what? She left and you realized that was the missing ingredient, right? And so yeah. you, you found that missing ingredient and brought it back home. But Glenn, you have a question to ask your brother. I would love for you to be able to do that and, and welcome. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, uh -oh. oh yeah. You, you, you mentioned this a long, long time ago in one of our conversations. I'm getting old. My memory doesn't work that well. You have several patents on your wall. Yes. Did you ever consider going into patent law? Well, I, when I went through my master's, I would have loved, one of my goals would have been to become a lawyer. And unfortunately, when you're working, and you have to finish a law degree in four years, it's difficult to do that. And I realized that I didn't have the time to do that. But it, as I always tell people, when I retire, I can always go back to school and become a lawyer. That's, you, I have my attorneys that I deal with on a daily basis. And you know, why don't you go to law school? I'm like, because I, ha I know more about your cases than you do. I manage all the cases. The only thing is I don't go before the judges. I contact them. I contact the clerks. I manage God knows how many cases in one day mm -hmm. in between emails from the courts, documents to file. And it, it's more fun digging into it that way than actually being a lawyer. So you know, you're, you have to know your limits and know what you want to do. Right. And, and, and I do have 
a few patents. Uh, and the thing is, when you have to defend your patent to get the final oh. approval, you, you're talking to people that know about a thimble worth of what the whole patent is about. Mm -hmm. And you have, have, I have several cases. Have to, you have to teach them what it is. And I, and that's where I, I, uh, those people know by the time they're done, they know quite a bit about a lot of stuff. So I, I admire all the patent reviewers and the patent attorneys because that is, they, that is complicated. They, they know a lot about everything. <laughs> so talk a little bit about those patents. How, how did it go about? Because I'm sure there was a lot of failure in getting to the point where you had something that you could then submit for a patent. Uh, I got some design patents at uh, Warner Lambert, which was just the shapes of things, which is not difficult to get. But but some of the other uh, patents we had in regards to stability of sweeteners, um, flavor extensions, uh, coating, you know, we had a product that the coating would never stay on. So you mm -hmm. couldn't, but it goes, <laughs> so we worked around, how do you do it? it? Took about two years to develop the process. And we realized uh, that not only did we develop a process, but it was nobody else had, had this. So you, you uh, go about and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a long process. You fill out your invention disclosure. You put everybody... Again, here's where you talk about the team. Nobody, you know, some people have their own name on a patent, but most of the time when you work for a company, you, you're, the team you're working on goes on the patent because everybody had an input into a, to uh, some form of that in, in, invention. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and then you go down the path. And as I said, I've got about 15 of them and each one, was its own little world of development. Sometimes you get, as I mentioned earlier, it's outside the box thinking that allows you to get them. Okay, and and talk about we we talked a lot about the the challenges of getting to the point where you can get that. What do you think, just from a from a challenge or, or failure standpoint? Can you talk a little bit about one of your one of the things that you may have just been fully engaged in and, and was disappointed because it failed, but you were able to bounce back. How do you go about doing that? Can you talk a little, give us an example of that? Oh, well, again, not all projects succeed. And uh, you go down path and you spend a lot of time, you know, your projects become your babies and you, you carry them down you, you try to nurture them, you make them, you try to make them uh, succeed. And sometimes they don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you have failure. And, and one of the things I, I used to take it personally, and I said, oh my God, I put all this effort into this. And it's, it's failure of either we can't afford the process. You no, know, the capital investment just doesn't make uh, it work. The margins aren't there. Um, it, or it just is doesn't wanted by the consumer, or we just can't make it. Yeah, yeah. I've learned, and I've told people, you know, because I've deal, dealt with project teams where uh, where I was a uh, project manager, and people used to come in like, "Oh my God, what, what are we going to do?" I said, "Relax. Don't take it personally." Like I used to. I, you you finally learn that it's not your fault. It's, it's a multitude of events that lead up to this not happening. And telling younger people that, that start in the uh, company, you know, we're marketing, it's their first project, and it goes nowhere. And they'd say, oh, my, God, my boss is going to kill you. I said, my boss isn't going to kill you. It, it's not your decision. It's a decision of manufacturing, finance, R&D, quality. It, it, you know, procurement, it, it's the whole team team that caused this to uh, logically be put to bed. 
that and that that's important because I want everyone to really take in this. It's you could have the greatest idea on earth you believe, but if the consumer doesn't is not looking for it at that time, if again it's timing, if <laughs> the market is not there for it, if the cost to actually produce it and, and, a, and mass produce it in a way in which may, uh, a number of consumers can get it. And when we're talking about product, it's just, it may just not be the right opportunity in the right time. A lot of things that take place is all about timing. And, and so we know that, um, and did we, did we lose you, uh, Bob? Yeah, I think you lost him. There you go. We just lost him. There we go. So the the whole, whole piece is for people to understand that you can't don't don't like you said don't take it personal. Sometimes it's all about timing, and it's about what the market will bear. Let's, uh, hold on, we got you on, on mute. Let's let's get you off of mute here. All right, there we go. There you go. Again, you know, just because as you said it could be timing. But when you have a failure, you don't forget the project. You put it on that shelf because, you know, there is a, sometimes a, uh, oh, a new person will come into marketing and say, well, what about this? And you say, well, we've already done that, but it could be four years later or five years later. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. My, my, my philosophy is if you don't have to do work, don't do it. Now, was there was there is there any candy product that happened like that that you know you you maybe you had out or thought about releasing years before and it just wasn't the market for it and then suddenly bam, ten years later, five years later, there's a can that that same candy is is uh, reintroduced to the market or what have you. Well, I won't go into names of products or anything, but yes, I would <laughs> something for eons and eons. And every time there was a new person in that department, I take my 10 page presentation and present it. And we actually made samples and they said, well, there's no place we're at. We don't know where to sell this. So I, I just kept doing it. And, and, you know, people change and next person, here's my thing. And one day I'm reading an article and I called up the person, said, was this anything related to what you and I discussed about five years ago? And they said, yep. You never know when something's going to hit. That's and, it. And it's not even in our group. So it's... Now, that's interesting because you then have some candies that just stand the, the test of time, Tootsie Roll, even the Twizzler. That those have to be some of your, some of the top products, let alone be the Hershey bar itself. Right. right. It's just simple, straightforward. And sometimes it's just good to be that. Simple, simple is good. Simple is, simple is good. Simple is good. Simple is good. Now, let me ask you this question. How, how have you been able to take your leadership and and influence direction on something that you felt was extremely that you were very passionate about it or very um you felt was very important to the overall good of the company there's a product that many years ago we were asked to develop and and we didn't have time to to do prototypes it would have been forever and a day uh to do a prototype so what I did was I worked with our flavor suppliers and it was a coated product and we wanted to have two different sensations of flavor and coating. So how do you do that spending hours and hours uh, to make one variable? So we worked with the flavor suppliers to have a fondant made that we could wrap around a very simple center, which we can make by the thousands quickly. And it, was, it gave us an idea of flavor combinations that we could use. We could be able to evaluate 15, uh, well, it was sugar-free, so we, we tried not to have that many 
uh, but you can evaluate quite a lot fast. And that helped us get to a point where we developed a product and it was a product that met all five of the senses of the consumer they wanted. And we, it, it didn't look good. It was an aesthetically unappealing product. But I told my boss, it meets everything. And we went through a lot of cartwheels to put the product finally, the consumers, consumer had the upper hand there and why didn't wanted it. So it went, finally went on, on the market and it's still on the market. And, and let me ask you, it was one of, is that one of the, one of the projects that you really cherished or is there one that yes. you like, this is mine, that was one. That is one of the projects that I, I said is probably the, the best product I've ever put on the market. That, that is awesome. And, and it, I'll tell you, it, it, it's, it's frost mints. <laughs> frost mints. It's still out there. Still out there. And how have you, have, have you cherished your role as, as the principal scientist for Hershey? Do you, do you just love going to work every day? How do you stay motivated? I don't, I don't work. I enjoy what I do. <laughs> What's that saying? You know, you'll never work a day in your life if you enjoy what you do. Amen. I enjoy what I do. I enjoy what I do to uh, for the company. I enjoy what I do for the consumers. I enjoy what, what the company does ultimately to make the community that we live in and the, uh, the employees uh, successful. When, when, when you're successful and you and you push that out, a lot more people become successful. That's awesome. And like I said, this is all great things. You have plenty of students who are, I'm just ans asking a lot of the questions that they're delivering, which is Tristan. And, and Nicholas has a question regardless. What, what class did you find the hardest, the most challenging class uh, when you were in school? Any math class, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget, uh, what was it? Uh, I think it was Dr. Andres, uh, he's taught math and it was differential equations. And I'll never forget my father looked over my shoulder one night while I was studying after work. He goes, what's that? He goes, I said, it's math. He goes, there are no numbers. I said, yeah, I know. Uh, and I'll never forget the final. I needed an 80 to get a C, which I needed. And there were five questions and I got an 88. And I said to the professor, I said, what, how did I get, I know I got the first four, where did I get the last eight? He goes, well, it, you knew that it was how do you derive the, ex, the escape velocity of the earth? And I said, I don't know. So I just drew a rocket and I said, the thrust has to be greater than the weight of the rocket. And he goes, at least you knew that much. So you get eight points. <laughs> but math was my my suffering point <laughs> and that's interesting because there is some math in chemistry oh yeah <laughs> uh, but you you figured that piece of it out you you understand you understood the uh the 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 combination of different things and and i think that really seemed to be something that that you were interested in and how has it, but you started out in a, in a real career wise in a real chemical based company and then transition into a, a food based company. And, and I don't know that many people have figured that how you made that transition. How did that work? Well, again, when you first graduate, when I first graduated, uh, the world's your oyster. You just got to find, you know, the live ones. Uh, and I started out, as I said, in American Cyanamid in quality. And there was some chemistry required for that. And um, again, I, I think the commute there, going all the way out to Ballenberg from Brooklyn every day was not one of the things I was looking forward to. Uh, but I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned, you know, I, I learned a lot of basic quality control. I learned a little bit about the chemistry required to do some of the tests. Uh, when I got to the Department of Health, it was a medical 
area that I was working in, which, you know, I did some of the things I used to do in college as far as chromatography and so on there and testing uh, of the bloods, uh, the dry blood from the uh, infants that would come in. And then ultimately when I got to, you know, where I am in the career I am now, it was learning, you know, organic the basics of uh, food, food chemistry. And, and you, 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 you learn by listening, as I said earlier, and you learn by the people around you guiding you to uh, where you need to go. Hmm. Hmm. And that's it. And, and, and I don't know that it's good that we all take and understand the importance of not just chemicals in our, in our daily lives, but food chemistry and how important it is, right? Right. There's a true science to this, whether it's making candy or whether it's making some other product that is confectionery or, or not, it's important that we understand the science behind food. That's correct. I mean, each food category is different um, and each food category is important. Uh, in moderation, you know, everything is good for you, except <laughs> if you're allergic to it. And, and again, that's the other things you learn. Uh, when you go into uh, food food uh, in industry, is yeah. that you know there are people who can't eat your products, and you have to be careful of how you make them and where you make them, and and um, that's why every label copy states that there's all allergens, whether it be uh, tree nuts, whether it be uh, um, dairy, whether it be uh, Sweeteners, high intensity sweeteners that people mm -hmm. are allergic to. You have to put these statements on there. And you, again, I never knew that, but you learn it as you go, get into your career. So you, you, you may have been inspired at that time by, because in Brooklyn, right there was Domino Sugar, right? Oh, yeah. I, I applied there too. <laughs> <laughs> right there on the water. They, they had a facility. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just amazing how much food science has grown over the years. What do you, what do you, what is Hershey doing to continue its, its uh, to hold and maintain its position as one of the top food companies out here, especially when in the candy space? We, we always are looking for the next generation of people. We, we do, as I had mentioned uh, a while ago, we, we, Hershey does hire interns, uh, not only in the uh, R&D department, they hire them in the uh, engineering department, the quality department, but they also, in the finance, the business aspect, it's marketing, there, there, there are opportunities uh, within Hershey to uh, be an intern and learn, uh, learn about the industry, learn about the company, and if that's the area you're interested in, I highly recommend, you know, contacting our HR department. Um, use my name if you want. I don't know. It's going to get you anywhere, but <laughs> seriously, uh, we, we, we do that at, at Hershey. But again, not only at Hershey, but the associations I, I uh, work on, the American Association of Candy Technologists, the uh, Production Manager Confectionery Association, we also have student outreach programs where we have the students um, networking with people, uh, looking uh, with um, our website. Sometimes when they're available, companies will put their internships availability on there. Mm. So we, we try to uh, do the industry well through the associations. Uh, the AACT is an individual membership association, while the PMCA is a corporate membership. So, so it's two different aspects, all going towards the same thing. How can we grow the industry through training, mentoring, and uh, uh, learning? Uh, one of the things uh, that about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I, I was um, president of PMCA, and we were talking about, you know, I'd be looking out over this auditorium at our convention, 
saying, look around you. I said, you're all older or the same age as me. And I said, I'm gonna come here next year and some of you aren't gonna be here. I said, what we need to do is we need to start bringing in the younger generation. And I had a buy-in from, oh, five or six of the associations uh, to allow me to put together a, I call it a virgin um, video. It does not mention any companies. It does not show any products. It just talks about the confectionery industry and whether it's good for you. And we took 80 hours worth of, uh, and this was done with no budget. We hmm. eight hours of uh, interviews and a person put it together into a 17 minute uh, um, video, which is, on, which is on YouTube and people can go see and it's confectionery science. Is it for you? And anybody who's interested, take a look at it. It covers all, all, all aspects. Well, I think that's great to know. It's one of the things is it's important for students to, to get work experience in, in any type of practice in which they can gain experience, knowledge, and a better understanding of what the world has to offer. That's, that's one. Two, I think it's important for them to understand that uh, they, it may be coined old technology, but this, this, this old technology of food science is, is not anything to, to hold your head, uh, hat against. You should know that this is extremely important, whether it's the chemistry of it or the technology component of it, the combination of it is extremely important. So there's job opportunities throughout the company, like you said, in marketing and chemistry in, in sales, in science, in, uh, in technology, all this, correct? Right, and, and to take the science one more aspect, you know, we have sensory departments which run uh, our tests to determine the texture, the flavor, uh, shelf life of our products. And there are sensory scientists out there, uh, it, people who love statistics, that's an area that's important too to the food in, in industry, not just confectionery, but all food in, food industry. Got it. Now, let me ask you this, because we have some questions here. As, uh, Escadar asks, did you do any internships or, or what was it that assisted you in, in obtaining your first uh, employment opportunity? No, I, I worked for manufacturers, Hanover Trust and Key Food Supermarket. Uh, I never had the opportunity uh, to do, I didn't even know there were internships available when I, when I in, back then, um, nor did I know that there was a food science that, <laughs> that people could get. I learned that after the fact. But again, oh, it, it's what you do with what you have and where you want to go that's important. So in the end, it's back to your earlier points of having the passion and having the determination to go out and seek what you need and then finding where there may be gaps or holes in, in what you have. And so you go get additional training, i.e. Right. MBA, and, and you right. add to that. And, and all those things are, are important as, as students begin to think about what they want to do. You may not know, it may not be, it, the key piece for these guys, Bob, is they have you to, to hear and say, hey, internships are important. They exist, yeah. go find them. Right. And um, that is important for these students to know. But what else, as, as we get ready and, and wrap this up, if you have any other questions, please drop them. Uh, but as we get ready to wrap this up, what would you say are some other key points of advice that we can give uh, some students that are listening today? Be your own person. Do what you want to do. Don't give up. Diversify into more than one area to help your uh, knowledge and career path grow and be successful. Succeed successfully. That's what I would say. I, I love it. I'm, you know, my, my takeaway is that I hope everyone, your love for science is definitely clearly on display here, but the key piece is your, your understanding of how relationships work and how they've helped you get to where you are, uh, your ability to lead with transparency and your understanding that everything doesn't happen on your time, but it happens in time. 
and timing is everything. Right. And those are important. Um, something that Jamal brought up, and I'm not sure is because you had the best shot in which it rained on everyone in basketball or something else, but he said that you were known as the hurricane. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I got the name. Uh, I believe in getting your work done quickly. <laughs> and I was your go, answer on that, in the, on that exam. I, I used to go in, in, into the factories. I used to send down all my protocols before I got there. I used to go into the factory and they had better have been ready to go. And I, we'd go through it and I'd be out. And people said that when you left, you took the wind with you and, you, and everything was done and you left us with a mess. <laughs> so uh, I got it because of my persistence in getting, wanting to get things done quickly and correctly. Look, sometimes that's what it's all about. Short, simple, to the point, but efficient and thorough. I think that's, that's what we all get to know as the, as the principal scientist for Hershey. We appreciate your time as an alum of St. Francis College. We appreciate the, the impact and effort that you're making to continue to uh, allow the school to build dynamic leaders like yourself. So thank you. Thanks can I, for the can I just add one more thing? Absolutely. And one of the things is, is you know, I spent 93% of my time in R&D. Three years ago, I had a stint in operations business development, which helped me grow even more before mm. I went back to R&D. And then it enhanced me into project management, costing, in-depth costing, cash flow, finance, uh, capital investment, co-manufacturing, everything. And it was probably something when I came back to R&D, I brought a new perspective, which uh, is being enjoyed because we're not wasting time in regards to, we fo focus in on costing, we focus in on consumer acceptability quickly and to the point before the project gets too far down the line to say it's no good. So again, I, I stress diversification, it helps you succeed. Well, what I took from that, Bob, is, is exactly what we should all be thinking about. It's never too late to learn. And continuous improvement is what we should all be focused on. So anything that you can read, anything that you can build uh, expertise in areas that you're, that you're currently weak, continue to work on, your, on those pieces. And, and you can be Bob. And, and, and you can see that Bob is surrounded by a great family that is also part of the St. Francis family. So all of those people pushing each other is what you all need as students, push each other to be better. And a shout out to my three children, Tara, Maura, and Sean, who all graduated from different universities and are succeeding well. And that's a positive take. That's what it's all about. Thank you all and Tom, Kristen, Jamal, President Miguel, he sends his regards. Monique, everyone that's part of the St. Francis team that pulls these off. David Lutfi, Lutfi everyone else. Joseph, thank you for all of your support in, in making these things happen. Bob, we appreciate you and uh, look forward to you staying connected. Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today.